I'm Lori Lalakea, um, for those of you who don't know me, um, and I am at Valley Medical Center as chief there, and then I am also a, an affiliated clinical professor here at Stanford. Um, and I'm excited to talk with everybody today about climate change and health from 101 to what otolaryngologists can do. Um, thanks for allowing me to speak today. Um, this is something I've become more interested in over the uh, past year because of my own personal climate anxieties. Um, you know, there are new feeds, news feeds every day reporting some climate catastrophe, and that can be quite overwhelming. We worry for ourselves, our families, our communities, and our future. We would like to do something, but how can we make any kind of a difference? I'd like to share with you tonight some of what I've learned. The climate crisis is also a human health crisis. And as such, we as physicians and otolaryngologists have much that we can do if we choose to contribute our expertise towards this effort. Climate change is not just about polar bears anymore. It is not happening in the distant future. It is increasingly apparent that it is about people and health and that it is here and now. Climate change is affecting people and places that we care about. Children, especially children of color, are suffering from more severe asthma. Uh, wildfires are worsening air quality into the very unhealthy range. As we experienced in 2020 on the days that the sky turned orange and that soccer practices were canceled as we sheltered in our homes. The record-setting heat wave in September of this past year led to heat illness and other health effects, but it also led to power outages that uh, shut down three out of the uh, South Bay hospitals and uh, created significant disruptions to patient care. It is this impact of climate change on health that is our entry point as physicians and healthcare workers to take an active role in climate change mitigation. The need for action is urgent. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, and land. This degree of climate change and the rate of change is unprecedented. Human-induced climate change is already leading to extreme weather events in every region of the world. No matter what emissions-reducing actions we take starting now, we are locked into 30 years of worsening climate impacts. There is still a small window for us to save our future. Climate change is the greatest global health care threat facing the world in the 21st century. Since 2015, the Lancet has been uh, compiling an annual countdown report assessing progress towards the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement goals, where uh, countries committed to keep climate uh, change to well below 2 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, progress towards those goals has lagged, but this intersection of climate change and health has been the focus of more attention in recent years. Uh, reframing the climate crisis as a health crisis has been gaining steam. In uh, September 2021, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, together with 220 other healthcare journals in the world, simultaneously published an editorial calling for emergency action to limit global temperature increases, restore biodiversity, and protect health. And this past year, after a lengthy lobbying effort by committed physicians, the AMA adopted a policy declaring climate change a public health crisis. Through the lens of human health, uh, uh, this is our opportunity um, to have a voice and an impact. We can uh, view this as a medical emergency, uh, but it is a medical emergency that few of us have been trained for. We, many of us lack a comprehensive understanding of the many ways that climate change is already affecting human health, uh, and we are uncertain about how we can engage in a meaningful way. With that in mind, the remainder of this talk will cover the following topics. Uh, we will uh, first look at uh, the 101 aspect covering the ways in which climate change affects health, and then how does health care affect climate change? We'll go over some sustainability principles. And then we'll move on to the what we can do portion. Um, we'll cover opportunities for engagement relating to education, research, and advocacy. 
And at the end of the talk, I have some conclusions and resources. Uh, before discussing specific health impacts, it's important to note that the impacts of climate change are disproportionately affecting some communities and demographics due to effects of systemic racism, inequities in living conditions, power, and health. As such, climate change harms intersect with social justice issues. As best said by Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, California Surgeon General from 2019 to 22, climate change is not an equal opportunity killer. Climate health harms are unevenly distributed and compound other health inequities. They disproportionately affect vulnerable populations, including children, elderly, persons of color, low income, unhoused individuals, those in poor health, women, outdoor workers, those who are physically or cognitively impaired, and those who are socially isolated. And as many of us are physicians who treat children, it's important to note that uh, uh, children are particularly vulnerable due to their immature physiologic systems, their inability to thermoregulate as adults can, uh, and their proportionally higher intake of food and water um, and air um, uh, compared to their size, which means that they have a proportionally uh, greater exposure to harmful to toxins. <coughs> they spend more time outdoors, which also in in uh, increases their exposure to heat and uh, poor air. Um, and they are more vulnerable as they have limited capacity to adapt on their own to cope with weather-related disasters. Uh, these effects in children are particularly exacerbated in those who are persons of color or who are also low income. Okay, this one is a big one. Climate change is an intergenerational equity issue. And if you read through this quote, it's pretty sobering. As parents, we are intensely committed to the safety and health and happiness of our children. And of course, it, viola it violates our sense of justice um, that we would live our lives to the detriment of generations to come. And yet we are. Our strong motivation to protect children's well-being can be leveraged to fuel our actions and those of others. So how does climate change affect health? The effects are large and costly. The NRDC uh, report uh, shows that U.S. health costs are estimated, me, U.S. health costs related to climate change are estimated to exceed $820 billion per year. So that's important to consider when we think about the cost of mitigating climate change in that the costs of an action are substantial. Uh, this is a graphic from the CDC that um, people often post, um, and it shows the many ways that climate change can affect human health. So in the center of the graphic, you can see that CO2 level, levels, rising temperatures, more extreme weather, and uh, rising sea levels have a additive uh, effect, and that in turn leads to effects on water and food supply, environmental degradation, uh, extreme heat, severe weather, air pollution, changes in vector ecology, and increasing allergens. And then these, in turn, have additional effects on human health. Uh, regarding allergens, uh, Dr. Nadal's group, I'm hearing a bit of an echo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Dr. Nadal's group here at Stanford uh, documented a uh, lengthening of the local allergy uh, or pollen growing season by eight to nine weeks over the past two decades. And that is substantial. I mean, two months longer uh, pollen season in our local area in the past two decades. And so it's no surprise that the increase in prevalence of allergic rhinitis has been documented in many areas around the globe, as have increases in allergic asthma. The burden of AR, asthma, and sinusitis are expected to continue to rise. So the next few slides, we're going to do uh, just uh, heat, weather, and air pollution. And that's not to say that these other effects are not really, really important. Uh, they are just a little less important right now in the U.S. compared to globally. 
Okay, so heat has myriad effects on human health and is the number one cause of uh, weather-related death in the U.S. Of course, it causes heat stroke and heat exhaustion, but it also exacerbates COPD and asthma. It exacerbates cardiovascular disease or ischemia and dysrhythmia. It causes or it increases the chance for preterm birth and low birth weight. Uh, and then more relevant for laryngologists, it increases accidental and non-accidental trauma. Um, you know, you can imagine when everybody's hot and bothered, domestic violence is more of a thing. Severe weather related to climate change has direct and indirect effects on human health. Uh, in 2020, uh, in this map, it's showing that there were 22 so-called billion dollar weather and climate disasters in the U.S., or disasters that exceeded a billion dollars. These events, of course, resulted in injuries uh, and death, mental health, of health effects, uh, and increased infectious disease burdens. But there's also the important effect of health care disruption. Uh, of course, when you have severe weather, maybe then your hospital is flooded or has a power outage. There's staffing issues. Uh, there's uh, difficulty with supply chain disruption. And that all leads to effects on access and quality of care. Uh, not only for those directly harmed by the, by the disaster, but for those seeking uh, unrelated care for emergent um, or ongoing health needs. So that can disrupt the um, access to your radiation therapy or to timely surgery. Or grandpa is having chest pain, but your local hospital ED is on diversion status, and the next ED over is jammed. So second order effects. OK, moving on to air pollution and air quality. Uh, worldwide, air pollution kills about 9 million people per year. Uh, of course, we can anticipate that COPD and asthma are worsened due to ozone and particulates. Uh, Long-term pollution associated, is associated with the onset of childhood asthma, which is terrible. Uh, it also has an effect on ischemic heart disease and CVA, which was new to me. And of course, wildfires, which themselves are exacerbated by the effects of climate change, lead to further air pollution. Smoke and particulate matter spreads far and wide um, and increases ED visits, hospitalization, and premature death. Okay, um, so air pollution and air quality impacts on Odo HNS. Um, I found this interesting article. Snoring and sleep disorder breathing are positively associated with variances in air quality. Sinusitis. Uh, the incidence, prevalence, and disease severity are affected by exposure to air pollution and particulate matter. And particulate matter in particular has been identified as a possible risk factor for eosinophilic CRS with nasal polyposis. There's a recent uh, systematic review um, that concluded that uh, higher air pollution exposure is associated with greater prevalence of otitis media in children. And there's also a, a possible association with head and neck cancer. Um, what you see is an abstract uh, from the recent AHNS meeting uh, that showed a, uh, that greater ambient air pollution exposure may be a factor that increases predisposition to certain head and neck cancers. And there are additional articles in the literature um, that uh, have cited that air pollution may be associated with increased nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal cancers as well in Taiwan um, and in uh, China. Okay, mental health. So we talked a little bit about event-related mental health issues, um, and among them, that can be economic stresses, that you've lost your home, you've lost your livelihood, and of course, that is going to affect your mental health. Uh, but then, you can also have mental health issues just from the climate change itself, the worry about it. Uh, depression or anxiety, that so-called echo anxiety or echo trauma. Feelings of grief for your changing world. Uh, feelings of helplessness as well. Uh, a recent survey of U.S. adults showed that 64% of U.S. adults were at least somewhat worried and 30% were really worried. And about half of U.S. adults feel that climate change is going to affect their own families. 
This was an additional survey in um, young adults aged 27 to 45. 60% vary or extremely concerned regarding the footprint of having children, and 96 vary or extremely concerned about the well-being of existing or hypothetical children. So maybe I'm not going to have a child because I am worried. Okay, that was a whirlwind about the effects of climate change on health, and now we're going to move on to the impact that health care has on climate change. Uh, this was an eye-opener for me. Um, healthcare has a substantial carbon footprint. So healthcare worldwide um, is, uh, uh, houses between 4.4 and 4.6% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. If healthcare were a country, it would be the fifth largest emitter. Let's just pause for a minute. <laughs> That's terrible. In the U.S., healthcare produces 8 to 10 percent of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, just read that over one more time. 8 to 10 percent of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. treats 4 percent of the world's population, and yet it accounts for 25 percent of global healthcare carbon footprint. Hospitals are the second most energy intensive commercial buildings in the U.S., and we are the most polluting healthcare system in the world. This is a quick graphic that shows uh, per capita healthcare greenhouse gas emissions uh, plotted against GDP. So you can see the USA right here. Yeah, this is not a game we want to win. Uh, you can see that we produce far more greenhouse gas emissions than other countries, even countries that are more wealthy than ours. And we know that healthcare outcomes in the U.S. are no better than uh, that of other first world countries. Okay, as quoted here, as medical professionals, our commitment is to do first no harm. Places of healing should be leading the way, not contributing to the burden of disease. So we must do what we can to reduce healthcare's greenhouse gas footprint so it is not adding to the climate change that harms the health of those we have pledged to serve. Uh, recognizing the urgency of addressing U.S. healthcare emissions to mitigate climate change, the Department of Health and Human Services recently asked for a commitment to reduce healthcare greenhouse gas emissions back in 2022. Um, the quote here says from uh, Secretary Javier Becerra says, sitting on the sidelines is not an option. And part of the pledge was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 50% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Uh, the pledge further um, uh, asks for attention to climate resiliency plans including attention to the needs of those at disproportionate risk. Including federal facilities, uh, over 100 healthcare organizations um, have signed on to this pledge, and that overall is, about, uh, is over 1,000 hospitals. Uh, that includes Kaiser and Stanford. And there's this new uh, Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, OCHI, uh, uh, not OCHI, but OCHI, um, that uh, facilitates uh, climate health efforts. Okay, so where do greenhouse gas emissions come from in the healthcare sector? Uh, this is a graphic that shows some of the ways, um, and we need to understand this to understand how do we get to uh, meaningful reductions. Um, so they come from a variety of sources, including energy use, waste management, supplies and materials, vehicles, meat production and food transport, waste anesthetic gas, and employee commutes. Um, you'll hear about scopes if you get deeper into sustainability topics, and so um, the greenhouse gas emissions are divided into scope one, two, and three. Uh, the scope one is on-site energy, so energy that your own facility produces, fleet vehicles, refrigerants, and waste anesthetic gases. Scope two is purchased electricity and purchased steam. But the really big one is scope three. 
So on the far side of the slide, you'll see that scope three is, uh, is uh, 71 percent of the total footprint is attributable to scope three. And this is mainly supply chain, the things that we, uh, the services and the things that we purchase and use. Um, and it has a really, really high impact. Um, supply chain is part of the hidden cost of healthcare. Goods are produced far away. They're produced unsustainably, uh, without regulation perhaps. They're then packaged with, uh, in further plastic and shipped halfway across the globe. We use them, we waste them. Either way, they end up um, in landfills. And all of that, that, that whole cycle, attributes to healthcare's footprint. Not just greenhouse gas emissions. U.S. healthcare is also responsible for 9% of the country's air pollution, 12% of its acid rain emissions, 10% of smog forming emissions. It has a deleterious effect on human health. 405,000 disability adjusted life years are lost annually in the U.S. due to healthcare greenhouse gas. Uh, so it's a lot. And not just waste, uh, sorry, not just emissions, also waste. Um, the photo is from a, a recent case that uh, Chloe and I did uh, that was a two centimeter incision and a child for a pre auricular pit excision. And we did it in the main OR and it made all that garbage. Uh, so we need to be more aware of that and then we need to find ways to reduce that. The average US hospital generates nearly five million pounds of waste in a year. That's six and a half tons in a day. Um, and it has a big financial cost as well as the environmental cost. In 2014, it was nearly $6 billion spent on medical waste management. Uh, this article uh, was related to cataract procedures. Um, and they measured that 45% of drugs that they were using on the procedure by volume were unused. Um, and that led to uh, nearly $200,000 of uh, money wasted in the year. And this one is a study that came from UCSF Neurosurgery. 13% uh, of supplies unused, nearly $3 million a year of, uh, of money wasted. So surgery uh, has a particularly large carbon footprint, and that's, that's relevant to us who are surgeons. If it's, if it's not bad enough what healthcare is doing generally, perioperative settings generate 50 to 70 percent of hospital waste. Uh, perioperative settings consume three to six times more energy than the rest of the hospital. And so uh, you, one way of taking this is we have a big opportunity uh, to engage as surgeons. We'll talk just quickly about some sustainability principles, um, which is really an introduction into what you can do. Uh, this is from Practice Green Health, which is an excellent resource um, that you probably, I know your institution belongs to it, and you can probably get access yourselves as individuals. Um, here are some of the uh, common impact areas for uh, sustainability efforts. So, of course, engage with your leadership, uh, reduce waste and toxic chemicals, pivot to sustainable food, green the OR, sustainable procurement, leaner energy, use less water, green building, and then greening and reducing transportation. So some of this, you know, you're going to hope that your administration is going to help with, like things like green building and energy use, uh, but many of these are appropriate uh, and even require clinician engagement. So what are the four, the five R's? Uh, basically, uh, refuse to use something or uh, reduce what you're using, reuse it, repurpose it, or recycle it. Uh, the diagram is from a paper published last month in the Journal of American College of Surgeons that reviewed existing literature regarding QI improvement initiatives that aim to reduce the environmental impact in the OR while also reducing costs. So they use the triple bottom line approach that uh, businesses use, incorporating the cost of an activity um, in terms of cost to the planet, 
uh, cost to the uh, uh, the um, sorry, let me back up. Uh, cost to the the planet as well as money costs, and then uh, patient satisfaction and safety. <coughs> where the circles overlap, that's kind of the sweet spot. That's where um, we can uh, uh, maximize money cost, and we can also maximize, or oh, sorry, minimize money cost and minimize the uh, planet cost of the um, things that we do. Uh, the paper concluded that uh, QI initiatives that both reduce cost and environmental impact have been successfully implemented across a variety of centers with cost savings that range from modest to significant, but with environmental savings that um, can be quite substantial. Um, we're going to pivot to a few examples at Stanford and elsewhere. And I think anything that about sustainability needs an understanding of red bag waste. So red bag waste is also called uh, regulated medical waste. Um, and the reason why that's important is that it has a higher footprint because all these items have to be autoclaved or incinerated. And it also has a higher financial cost. So it's up to 40% of waste management in any hospital. Um, the the uh, cost of that is attributable to red bag waste. What really has to go into red bag waste is fluid blood and blood saturated items. So not your gown that has a drop of blood on it, but blood saturated items. Uh, you know, IV tubing that has blood in it. Um, and also um, uh, body fluids from patients who are on isolation precautions. Uh, but as you can see in the picture below, um, and it, uh, maybe not at your institution, but certainly at mine, uh, regular waste is often erroneously mixed in and that drives up the environmental cost and the financial cost. This was an awesome QI project that was completed by the ortho team here at Stanford. Um, they undertook this project in 2018 to reduce red bag waste in the OR. And they educated the staff about what goes in the bag and what doesn't. They changed the uh, red bag uh, to a red bucket, this guy here. Um, and they put a little something across the top of it so that you, you think, before I throw something in here, is this something that goes here? Um, it's a little small, but they, their baseline measurement was nearly 25 pounds of waste per case. And they just hit it out of the park. They reduced their red bag waste to three and a half pounds per case. And then they, they outsourced this project from ortho rooms to the rest of the ORs and had a 98% compliance. So really great example of a QI initiative that was brought forward by a small group uh, with a large and successful carbon footprint print reduction. Uh, you wouldn't have to limit this to ORs. Um, there's red bag waste in your ICUs and throughout the hospital. Um, and there are some strategies that, that can be thought of to try to make an impact there. Um, you might notice sometimes that maybe the red bag waste bucket in your is the more convenient one. And you don't even think about it. You just put your trash there. Um, so anything that any intervention needs to take some of the thought out of it um, and make it so that you are um, hard put to make a mistake. Okay. So waste audits, um, another way to uh, think about reducing waste. Um, it starts by making initial assessment of uh, how much waste is there and what is that waste, so putting it into categories, and then um, designing and undertaking waste reduction interventions. Uh, this is a project um, example here from Stanford XRT. Um, it's led by a resident, uh, Claire uh, Daniel, uh, currently in process. Uh, but it's been gaining traction, um, such that um, it's, uh, UCSF residents are also uh, undertaking a similar effort. Uh, Stanford PM&R um, did a similar type of thing in their outpatient uh, procedure clinic and had that uh, published. Um, and there are a number of papers in the literature that uh, identify opportunities for this kind of action throughout settings, including EDs and ICUs. Um, uh, outpatient units. Okay, 
in the OR, uh, lean pack and reformation of your instrument trays um, and consideration for field sterility. Field sterility meaning we're not going to drape everything, we're just going to drape the smaller field. Um, so these are ways you can reduce footprint. So lean packs mean that's, that's the big blue thing that comes in that's pre-packed and gets unwrapped and has the plastic buckets in it and the suction tubing and some gowns and some drapes and it all is prepackaged ahead of time. Um, and so if you were to try to reduce that, what you'd have to do is look at your pack and decide with your colleagues, what do we want, what don't we want, what can we substitute out. Um, but then every time that, that lean pack gets open, it's less stuff. Uh, reformatting instrument trays means, do I really need all this stuff? Because once those trays are opened, they all have to go to the autoclave. And the autoclave is a big energy use. Um, and so even if you didn't touch the instrument, it's been opened on the back table, it has to go to the autoclave. And so reformatting your instrument tray it has to do with what do we really need and what could just be up separate as, you know, in desperation, I might need X, um, rather than having everything out on the table. Okay, so this is a project undertaken by Stanford Hand Surgeons, where they built on the work of others to make uh, their carpal tunnel surgery greener. Um, they, as a group, had some consensus about what they wanted in their pack and what they wanted in their instrument trays, and they used field sterility, which has been uh, uh, proven to be uh, safe in hand surgery. So that means less draping and no gown. Uh, if implemented across the U.S., these measures would result in $2 million of uh, cost benefit as well as the avoidance of 1 million pounds of waste. The upper photo shows what the pack looked like, what their setup looked like before, and the lower photo shows what their leaner footprint looks like now. So field sterility has been um, uh, established for hand surgery and for Mohs surgery, but research regarding applicability to um, other specialties, including ours, is needed. Uh, data regarding uh, green carpal tunnel surgery was uh, published in this article, Environmental Impact of Orthopedic Surgery, and you may recognize some of the names up there as some of your orthopedic colleagues here at Stanford, and a number of them have taken on um, research into sustainability as, um, as part, of, uh, part of what they do. Um, a similar uh, project is underway regarding colorectal surgery here at Stanford uh, by Jacqueline Blue, uh, being mentored by Paige Fox, which, who is um, really big on sustainability efforts um, within the Department of Plastic Surgery here at Stanford. Um, so it's likely that in Odo HS, um, one or more or ten procedures could benefit from, uh, from this kind of approach. Um, with, with cost savings and with um, environmental saving as well. All right, quick note about anesthetic gas. Um, large impact on direct facility greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they're typically vented off of your facility rooftop, which was something I didn't know. Yep, just, just goes right up. <laughs> I see what Jay raising his eyebrows. Um, yeah. So your energy teams, I'm sure, are, are working on these things. I understand there is an anesthesia green team here at Stanford, uh, but it's important for you to be aware and to be engaged. Uh, you can see here in the lower graphic, some all anesthetic agents are not created equal. The really bad ones are desflurane and nitrous, uh, which have a much bigger footprint, and some hospitals have uh, abandoned des for that reason. Uh, nitrous, um, once it gets vented off your rooftop, it lives in the atmosphere for 114 years. Mm. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah, and then there's more of it tomorrow, and more of it tomorrow, and more of it tomorrow. Um, so, also, no matter what gas is used, what you see here at the top is 95% are exhaled, unmetabolized. That's called the WAG, waste anesthetic gas. Um, so. Alternatives are needed, um, and I know your anesthesiologists are aware of them. There's something called low fresh gas flow. Uh, TIVA, of course, local and regional anesthesia are important. 
And I think it's important that we be aware so that we can have a conversation with our anesthesia colleagues and some shared decision making around which of your cases um, can have um, a more sustainable uh, anesthetic. Okay, lots of other things. Um, reduce single use items, choose lower impact products like I sometimes put on clips and neck dissections. The old fashioned way of the reusable clip applier, I actually prefer it because I feel like I can, I can feel that clip coming down. Um, that's a much better alternative than the automatic one. Uh, there's something called uh, reprocessed equipment. Um, things like pulse ox uh, monitors can be reprocessed, for example, and ligatures. What that means is through a third party vendor that has been FDA approved, those items can be taken back, reprocessed, and then sold back at a lower cost. So financial savings, but it's also an environmental savings because that item, if it's used three times before it hits the landfill, has a third of the, uh, of the footprint than if you used it only once. Um, of course, instead of the plastic basins and the plastic pitchers in the OR, you know, could we go to the metal ones and like we used years and years back? Can we have reusable gowns and drapes? Um, can we think more about uh, prescribing responsibly um, and doing more remote visits as appropriate um, and not, not ordering tests just for the heck of it because all of those have a footprint. You know, if you give a patient 30 tabs of something and they only really use three of them or they don't use them at all, um, that goes into the landfill. And its whole footprint from when it was made and packaged and shipped, that all was for nothing. And so being more intentional um, and thinking about it, I think, is important. And then food, uh, quick thing about food. Um, so the food industry also has a huge uh, footprint, especially for meat. Um, we counsel our patients, eat less meat because that's better for your health. Um, and yet we're serving it in our hospital rooms and our cafeterias. Uh, reducing or eliminating meat and promoting a plant-based diet in healthcare facilities models behavior that improves patient health and planet health, uh, while also reducing our greenhouse gas footprint. So, um, I understand that at UCSF, there are medical students who are for a sustainable future, successfully lobbied to reduce meat serving um, in, the, in at least some of their facilities, which is really, really awesome. And then one other comment about reusable gowns. Um, potential cost savings there, a number of centers have gone to that. And the, the cost saving is that we avoided having to pay for the waste management. So there's, you know, there's, you have, there's some water, there's some laundry soap, there's some labor, there, there are that. Um, but centers, some centers have gone to it and have realized a cost saving because paying for it to go to the landfill has a cost as well. Um, in centers that have gone with this, most users would way rather weigh a cloth gown, wear a cloth gown, and I understand that for most wears a cloth gown. Uh, I don't think for this particular reason, uh, but it's something looking into. Uh, all right. That's a lot. This is the good part. What can we do? I think you have some ideas based on what we've just gone over, you know, where some of the areas, um, target areas can be. Uh, but to recap, the climate crisis is a health crisis, and healthcare's carbon footprint is itself contributing to climate harms. It is therefore our opportunity and our obligation to be part of the solution. We are well positioned to leverage who we are through advocacy, through research, and through education. But one of our most important roles uh, is that of clinicians who care for patients. This idea of leveraging who I am <laughs> was a real light bulb moment for me. You know, I had listened to NPR and you're thinking there's another disaster and the trees are dying and what can I do? Um, but I don't know much about those things and I don't know how to have an impact. Um, but I do know about healthcare. Um, so this is how I can have an impact. This is my lane. And this is how I can channel my echo anxiety into a force for good. So I hope some of you will feel similarly. It's important to remember that clinicians can see opportunities that administrators can't. Um, 
Hospital administration may be best suited for things like green buildings and energy and, and your uh, vehicles. Uh, but as clinicians at point of care, you are experts in that domain and must show uh, those opportunities to administration. We are the ones doing the work, using the energy, consuming the supplies, and seeing the impact on your patients. So uh, take the opportunity to make your practice more sustainable, as we covered in the prior section, through your individual choices. Or even better yet, partner with others to pursue QI projects and research efforts in this arena. Do what you can. In terms of doing what you can, you and your colleagues and your institution have two important roles. So the first is to detect and describe and mitigate the health effects of climate change through your advocacy and your research and education. This helps to build social will for climate action as people care deeply about their own health and their family's health. And building social will, you know, whether it's at the, the ballot box or deciding between what's where are we going to spend you know, our political budget, uh, our actual dollars? It's critical that people have more will for taking the hard work of decarbonizing. The second role is to clean our own house with decarbonization and efforts to improve healthcare resiliency. I think we have a moral and ethical responsibility to do so and to be part of the climate change solution. We are past the time when it's acceptable to just describe the effects, um, and it is now imperative that we take an active role in decarbonizing healthcare. Uh, this is a quote from uh, John Balbus, uh, a physician who is director of the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. Um, so it is the healthcare community must make decarbonization and climate resilience a priority. And the climate community must make health care and health informed mitigation central to their work. Okay, back to who we are. Education is key to our role in facing the climate crisis. But most of us are not trained for this. Um, and yet, uh, climate change is coming towards us fast and furious. We need to educate ourselves. Our world and associated threats to health are evolving, and it's imperative that we educate ourselves to effectively meet these challenges on behalf of our patients and communities. And I do have some resources to share um, in this regard at the end of the talk. We need to educate our trainees. There are increasing efforts in some centers to integrate the topic of health and climate uh, into medical student and residency education. I know that, that uh, institutions like Harvard, Columbia, and UCSF are really leading their work way with this, and there's an opportunity for Stanford to move forward in this respect. And of course, we need to educate our patients, to keep them healthier, and to help them to understand the link between climate change and health harms. Okay, what about research? Large opportunity for climate and health scholarship. So topics include healthcare sustainability across all care settings, greener surgery, greener clinic practices, and leaner care in terms of visits, medications, and testing. How can some of what we talked about um, apply to our field? Can we make our surgery packs and instrumentations more lean? Can we establish which settings in which field sterility is enough? Um, and one way I think about that is like a lump and bump that over in the clinic, I might have just put on a pair of gloves and used one drape. Somehow when that comes over to the OR, it just, it just magnifies into a lot of waste. Um, so what are the right settings that field sterility would be right for a laryngology? Um, what of our patient visits would be best conducted remotely? Because when the patient gets in the car and comes to you, that's a big footprint. How can we streamline our care and our testing and our medication delivery? Uh, research is needed in topics related uh, to establishing greater health care and community resilience. So I don't know what the right questions are here, but are there patients that we treat that are a particular risk, such as PD patients with trachs and airway problems, or head and neck cancer patients undergoing treatment 
who would benefit from interventions to mitigate risks related to heat or air quality or power outage or care disruption? Are there ways that we could leverage uh, the health record, EPIC, uh, to identify patients at risk and then um, develop outreach efforts to keep them safer? For example, when unhealthy air quality is anticipated. Research is urgently needed to address the inequitable impacts of climate change. Dr. Megwalu has described the phases of equity research as detect, understand, and reduce. I know that there are a number of people in the department who have deep interest and expertise with equity and health disparity issues. And what are the right questions for us to ask here? Uh, which of our which of our patients uh, in our field are the uh, most susceptible to climate harms related to wildfire smoke or heat or other toxic exposures? I think some of this is our sinus patients, but I, again, I don't know exactly what the additional questions might be. Ongoing research is also needed to understand the effects of climate change exposures more broadly on the health of our patients uh, together with mitigation strategies. Uh, this referenced article by Kim et al., Climate Change, the Environment and Rhinologic Disease, recently published. Another author on this is our friend uh, Do Yan Cho. Um, it's a really great uh, review of what's known about the impact of climate change on, uh, on rhinitis um, and outlines where the gaps are um, and also highlights uh, the need for more disparity research. Uh, Peter Huang, uh, earlier in the week, told me that uh, the Stanford Rhinology Division is launching a major effort in rhinitis and climate change, which is really, really great. Uh, there is some money. Um, I think uh, this is a posting from the AHRQ and announcing interest in uh, research on climate change and healthcare just posted last month. Uh, they are particularly interested in uh, projects that look at carbon footprint that look at resilient healthcare systems and that address inequitable impacts. Um, I know there is also uh, money, smaller grants available through the uh, Woods Institute um, here at Stanford and through the Sustainability Office here at Stanford. Okay, moving on to advocacy. Uh, lots of opportunity here. Um, we have trusted healthcare voices. How can we use them? We can leverage not only who we are, but who we know. So that can be political lobbying, it can be presentations to your personal communities, traditional and social media, op-eds, media appearances, blog posts, websites. And we're not all suited to all of this kind of work. Uh, but here's, here's a great example uh, from the ophthalmologist. Um, it's a really excellent website called iSustain. Uh, created by a small group of committed ophthalmologists, including Barbara Ernie, who is an adjunct associate professor at Stanford. In addition to giving you uh, people guidance on sustainability in the clinic and the OR and drug waste, um, it has links out to a lot of literature um, and other resources related to climate, eye health, and general climate health harms. Uh, more, uh, we can engage and collaborate with colleagues. We can join a group talk to our professional communities, and engage our professional societies. Um, this is an interesting paper that I came across, uh, published just last year, that evaluated medical society engagement in climate change advocacy by reviewing public-facing websites for uh, these member organizations. And then they were scored, uh, 111 of them were scored, uh, based on inclusion of climate change content such as position or policy statements, committees, educational materials, practice recommendations, and so on. So 50 out of 111 organizations had at least some uh, climate uh, metrics that they met. I know this is small, so I'll read some of it out. Here's a portion of the results table, and there are a number, number of societies that had a really good score, like at the top, uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, had a score of 19. Uh, they're doing really, really well in terms of uh, climate, climate uh, action and climate content. Um, and then also on this list are the uh, Pediatrics, American College of Physicians, AMA, DERM, Psych, OBGYN, Ophthalmology, Ortho, PMNR, Anesthesia, Emergency Medicine, and Radiology. 
So we're down here to you know only nine points at radiology, and you don't see any AAO HNS yet. Uh, okay, so here's AAO HNS at the arrow with a zero, with with other zeros um, next next door. Uh, some of the zeros next door include the AFPRS, the Academy of Photolaryngic Allergy, uh, which seems kind of crazy, uh, and the Academy of Sleep Medicine. Uh, you know, to some of our companions here on this list, uh, so one of them is the Academy of Insurance Medicine. Another is the Association of Gynecologic Laparoscopists. So, yeah, we're, we're not, that's not great. Um, you know, we're a big organization, and this is, our patients are affected, um, and we need to have more of a presence. Um, you know, as physicians, we want to know what to do. And imagine how helpful it would be to have our national organization fully engaged, providing sustainability guidance, providing member education, having policy and position statements, an environmental committee that would help to identify research and advocacy opportunities. What if we had a website like iSustain? Um, there's, there's room for a lot more uh, involvement here. Yeah, what if we had some guidance on greening a common procedure like VES, like endoscopic sinus surgery? Uh, so I know that there are many department members who are actively involved with AAO HNS and could be strategized for <coughs> to more effectively uh, lobby for the academy to engage in this kind of work. Okay, um, and finally, we have the opportunity and responsibility to advocate within our institutions. So, you know, a project that you undertake in the OR, that's great, but wouldn't it be great if that was also part of a well thought out whole that went from the top to the bottom and from the bottom to the top again? Um, so, uh, addressing the climate uh, crisis needs to be something in which sustainability is embraced as a core institutional value that informs sustainability efforts throughout the organization. That engages the input of clinicians for programmatic and operational priorities, that aligns research priorities and incentivizes research priorities, that establishes and implements educational priorities, and that coordinates efforts and funding. Um, at Stanford, there's the Woods Institute, there's Stanford Human and Planetary Health, and there's the Door School of Sustainability. I understand the Door School of Sustainability has a ton of money. Um, from what I hear from others, these, these three entities, um, what, what their gap is on the clinical side. Um, and uh, having a more fruitful partnership would be really, 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 really great. Um, as an aside, um, Harvard, Columbia, UCSF, Yale are really leading the way in having this type of organizational structure around sustainability and embracing sustainability as a core value. So Stanford has an opportunity here to try to close that gap. Um, for those that are interested, um, I can connect you with others at Stanford who are moving forward with these kinds of things to establish sustainability and to coordinate efforts across the organization. Great time to jump in. I know departments of pediatrics and uh, psych have been particularly engaged so are there ways to use who we are and who we know to push this forward? All right, we're here at the tail end. That was a whirlwind tour. A few concluding remarks before having some Q&A. Um, healthcare, as currently practiced in the US, uh, is unsustainable and contributes to climate change and health harms. We have the opportunity and obligation to be part of the solution. I'm hoping that all of us will do what we can. There's a lot to do and many ways to contribute. So we don't all have to be on social media, but choose your lane, use who you are and who you know to do, do what you can. The Stanford Department of Auto HNS is comprised of individuals with immense talent and expertise and drive. We have department members with deep institutional knowledge and ties we have members of the Faculty Senate, the former Chief of Staff. We have those with ties and roles within the Academy, 
We have those with close relationships with the dean at the School of Medicine. We have members who are committed to health care disparity research and those with a deep commitment to children's health. We have numerous program alumni in positions of influence across the U.S. Imagine what we could do by capturing a portion of those talents and connections for meaningful climate action. And imagine how successes at Stanford have the potential to ripple outward for a larger impact. All right, last thoughts. Climate change is an immense existential threat. It's easy to feel like uh, what we do as individuals will have little effect. I do believe that together we can make a difference and that though what we do will not halt the changes that are already in motion, we can mitigate them. And we are obligated to do what we can for our patients and our communities and our children and our future. Our work is a necessary part of the greater whole of the necessary work that must be done. And I encourage those of us who are climate warriors to use some of that energy to become climate warriors. As a successful climate warrior, you need not vanquish the climate crisis by yourself by next week. Uh, as an example for my family, we grade exercise workouts on a zero to one score, zero to one scale. So you manage to drag yourself out for a run, it was kind of slow, it was kind of short, you had to stop and walk for a while. But on a zero to one scale, you went for a run. That's a one. That's great. So I encourage you to consider climate efforts in that light. What you accomplish today may not in and of itself solve the climate crisis. But what you do today is a necessary part of the process. And it absolutely could be a one on a zero to one scale. And it absolutely can be a step in the direction of building larger collective successes. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge with gratitude uh, Drs. Ernie, Nguyen, and Pepic, and Kelly, who helped me prepare this presentation. Uh, Brenda Nguyen is actually uh, the sister of someone we know dearly, <laughs> our friend Brian, um, so shout out for that. Um, I do have a couple of resource slides that I can share um, after Q&A, uh, including how to get involved at Stanford and resources at Stanford. I'd be more than happy to meet with any of you who are in the Zoom or here in the room to speak about how we might move forward and let me know if I can support you guys in any way. Um, thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make today a one on the zero to one scale for climate action. Thank you.